absolutely incredible. As you can imagine, these people have survived one of the strongest storms to ever hit this earth. And John, it is devastation everywhere you look. So think about it. We have seen entire, entire fields of debris places completely flattened. People are struggling to really even tell us the stories and what they lived through. Hours and hours of winds where they had debris pieces of their home running into them and through windows. When you survey the damage from over, overhead, John, there, there is just nothing left of this kind of community here. We're talking about damage 90 to almost 100 percent of everything that is here. But the stories that you hear about survival, people crawling into closets, crawling into bathrooms as their entire homes were lifted, roofs toppled, they could hear their appliances being flown around their backyards. And when you go through these islands, John, when you talk about the resilience they are going to have to have in the weeks and months to come, there is nothing left of these places. Right now, they are thankful that they are medevacking people out that need it. They are still looking for loved ones throughout these islands. The messages of desperation from people in other places of the Bahamas trying to find their family members on this island, they continue to come through. Thankfully, John, as you can see, the weather is cooperating. They are starting to get more aid into here and more search teams, and that includes the U.S. Coast Guard, which has been up above our heads several times already. We will continue to keep an eye on what goes on on islands like this because they are wondering what comes next, especially as they continually tell me they have never seen anything like this and have nothing left of their lives. John? The storm still has 105 mile per hour winds. Gusts of 125, it's still a category two, moving at nine miles per hour. So is moving much faster than it was through the Bahamas. Here's a closer look. You can see right there, the center of the storm off the coast of Jacksonville. And as it continues its northward journey, we'll continue to see the rain bands as well as the, the, the winds start to pick up in places like Savannah and Charleston. Uh, that's really where we're going to be concerned the most. But we are still getting those rain bands pushing on shore in Florida as well. It's going to pull away from there, make its journey to the north, and then eventually the east. The concern with Charleston is it's very vulnerable, it's low-lying, and any surge of water that comes in, which they'll get quite a bit of storm surge, can flood Charleston very easily. So we'll be talking about a Category 2 in this area uh, throughout the uh, midday range tomorrow, and then by the evening pulling away. But we could be looking at record or near record tides for the Charleston area, second to just Hugo. And that's huge if people lived in Charleston during Hugo. And remember, Cape Hatteras, uh, the Outer Banks, uh, we are looking at a Category 2 there by the end of the week. So, Jake, this is far from over. I know we've been talking about this storm for a long time. Some people have fatigue with this storm, but it is still very serious. And folks in the Carolinas need to take it seriously. It is only day two of work uh, for British MPs after the summer holidays, but Parliament has already seen an epic, epic showdown as Britain's deadline to leave the EU draws nearer. A rebel alliance of lawmakers rose up against the UK Prime Minister and moved to put a stop to a no-deal Brexit. Boris Johnson then sacked 21 members of his own party who had backed the measure, and he made good on his threat to seek a general election. Take a listen. The leader of the opposition has been begging for an election for two years. He has crowds of supporters outside calling for an election. I don't want an election, but if MPs vote tomorrow to stop negotiations and to compel another pointless delay to Brexit, potentially for years, then that would be the only way to resolve this. And I can confirm that we are tonight tabling a motion under the fixed-term Parliament. I think that the only positive thing one can take of this right now, we've really reached a breaking point, perhaps even a new breaking point. But I think that having Boris Johnson at the helm uh, and his group, his cabinet of Brexiteers, after these three years when uh, he allowed the transition and Prime Minister May to be there, is they're starting to understand while being in the hot seat, what it is really like to deal with this particular issue. And I think that what we have been witnessing in Parliament for the last uh, few hours uh, is essentially a, uh, a fight to the death on uh, the question of Brexit, uh, with Boris Johnson's party desperately trying to appeal to Nigel Farage and to the Brexit party, without whom they cannot win a general election. And on the other side of the political spectrum, the opposition coming together, not so much for something, for a particular definition of Brexit, but against a no deal. And it seems that as things stand right now, they've succeeded at least in achieving that. Thank you.